there so they could use some of your love. Um, for a $40 event, they've really offered a lot, and they're the only reason that we're able to have these nice badges and all this content for such a low price. Um, so after the talks, go downstairs, get some swag, leave your name on the mailing list if you're interested in their products, and um, you know, thank them for what they've done here. Our next speaker here is Scott Arviseth. He's going to speak on cloud security. Um, his presentation is sponsored by Cyber11. Scott is a security architect for um, a small local organization that some of you may have heard of, um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Small. He's worked the security field for over 15 years and worn several hats, from developer to architect. He holds GCWN, a GCFA, a GCIH, and a GPEN. He earned his bachelor's in computer engineering, and when not at work, he enjoys spending time with his family. The, the abstract of this talk here, um, the cloud is here to stay. Organizations are moving to the cloud to reap the benefits of agility and simplicity that it provides. Security is possible in the cloud, but it's going to require us to take a different approach. That approach depends on the cloud service the organization is consuming. Many cloud vendors are saying that security is a shared responsibility, but what does that really mean? What are the boundaries and how does that affect my network controls and so on? And um, I'm going to leave it up to Scott to tell us about that. Hear it for Scott. Hear me all right? right? Oh, this one? Okay. Maybe if I move it closer, does that work better? Or not? All right. Is this All right. Well, thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about cloud security. Um, when we talk about the cloud, the cloud means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it really depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at infrastructure as a service, Platform as a service, software as a service, or software and services. They're all different types of things, of, of services that you can get in the cloud. And usually when we're talking about moving into the cloud, you hear a lot of things like agility, scalability, resiliency, high availability. But where does security fit into all of that? Um, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. And when you talk about the cloud, what is really, what's really behind the cloud? Um, we're going to focus today a, a, a whole lot on Amazon Web Services. If you look at the Gartner reports, obviously Amazon is the clear market leader in cloud services. In the case of Amazon Web Services, you're looking at regions that are worldwide. They have 11 different regions all around the world, and basically what a region is is it's a set of um, separate and distinct data centers. Um, they call those things availability zones. And um, they have separate power, they have separate network, they have all, all different types of things there. They also have about 50 edge locations, or basically your uh, CDN stuff, uh, your, your static content. If you look at each one of those data centers there, you've got your traditional application stack there, where you've got your data up, 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 up on top, you've got your application, uh, your app framework, operating system, your virtual network, which is basically your VMs there running on a hypervisor on, on down to the physical facilities. So we, we approach this, we're going to look at that stack and how do we go about um, securing our applications out in the cloud. You see this phrase all over the place, security is a shared responsibility and that's especially true inside of the cloud. What you need to understand is what is your responsibility and what is your provider's responsibility. And that really depends on the type of service that you're trying to purchase from the cloud. If you're looking for software as a services, you may only be responsible for that top, that top um, layer, the data. If you're looking at 
platform as a service, you're looking at about the app framework on up. If you're looking for infrastructure as a service, you're really looking at from that virtual network on up. When you're evaluating cloud providers, there's a few things that you really need to look at, right? Really, what sort of things are they going to be willing to go, what, what sort of contracts are they going to be willing to enter with you um, as far as their responsibility and as far as your responsibility? When you look, you know, when you look at what's actually in the contract, what are they putting on their limits there? What are the financial limits? Um, what sort of things, what sort of assurances are they willing to give you? Um, also, looking to see what those providers provide in the way of um, attestations, right? If you're, if you're working on, for example, building a PCI implementation out in the cloud, does your provider have a level one um, PCI compliance attestation that they're willing to give you? And is that, has that been done by a third party rather than a, that organization? And you really need to make sure that those fit the, the need that, or fit the application that you're putting out there in the cloud. So as we talk, as I said earlier, we're gonna really focus in on Amazon Web Services. There's plenty of other services out there. This is just, this is just the one that I think is the most interesting um, to talk about. And we're gonna build our application. We're gonna build a basic web application, essentially out on Amazon Web Services. We're gonna talk about how we're gonna secure it. So really what we're looking at is infrastructure as a service on up, so virtual network on up, and then we're gonna use some PaaS solutions as well with uh, relational databases. How do we secure those things on up? Before we build any sort of application, I think the first step we always need to do is evaluate the risk, right? What, what are the things that we need to be most concerned about with our application? And when you look at it, where on this stack do you think our biggest risks lie? Are they down at the virtual network layer, the, the data layer, the application layer? Where are those, those risks lie? If you look at the uh, Verizon uh, data breach and incident re uh, report from 2014, you see a couple things. Um, first off, I've got the actions down there. I don't want those numbers to confuse you, the 133277. Those are... The the, um, the, free, the 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 most occurring actions that the attackers took. So for 2014, um, stolen creds were number one. Exported data were number two. The previous year, three and seven. The previous year, three and four. So we're really looking at the things uh, as we trend over the last three years. These are really the top things that attackers are trying to do. Let's go up to look at incident, incident classification. Web application attacks, number one on the list. That, that, as Verizon says in their report, that is the proverbial punching bag of the internet. Um, every web application is different. You don't have a lot of people developing those things. There are a lot of vulnerabilities in that. Even more interesting, 88% of those applications, those organizations whose web applications were attacked, did not detect it. Number two on the list, obviously, cyber espionage, Basically, people clicking on a link or getting sent some sort of malware an email or, or picking up a USB drive or doing something. Again, external dis externally discovered most of the time. So when we look at where those risks lie, you're looking at the higher layer of the stack. We're not worried, you know, the network type of thing is, is something we need to worry about, but our application is what they're going after, and that's what's going to be compromised. And we're not seeing it as organizations. When was the last time you heard of somebody breaking into a data center and, and taking some? You just don't hear about that, right? Doesn't occur today. So also, you know, who are, who are the attackers going to target? Are they going to target our users or developers or our DevOps teams? I think that's pretty obvious. They're going to be going after our DevOps teams. So let's go ahead and start building our application. Here is the Amazon AWS dashboard. We don't have near enough time to go through all of this stuff, um, but this gives you an idea after you get your account set up and you get logged in. Um, not only that, they also have a whole bunch of CLIs and APIs that you can integrate with. The whole purpose of Amazon Cloud Services is moving into, well, moving into the cloud, but also getting things automated. So the less that you have to do manually, the better off you're gonna be. That gives you the scalability, that gives you the um, availability, the resiliency that you want. We're going to hit upon that throughout the presentation. 
So here's our basic uh, architecture, and we're just going to kind of drill through a, a very quick um, pace all the different services that I'm going I'm to use in this, this simple impl implementation. We start out with our account, right? That account is um, what's assigned to me. It has my credit card information on it or my business information on it. Everything that I do out there, it's going to be charged back to me. There are, with that account, I can set up essentially virtual private clouds, VPCs, anywhere in the world. We talked about the 11 regions. US, U.S. East is one of those regions. They have them on the West Coast. They have them in Europe. They have them in Australia. They have them all over. Everything that I do with my account, I manage with um, their IAM service, um, Identity and Access Management. Everything that those users do with that account, I can track it with CloudTrail. Um, so when they spin up a new VPC, when they delete VPC, when they create instances, all those types of things I can, uh, I can track in CloudTrail. When we talk about data storage, there's a lot of different options here. We're just going to talk about S3, S3 sim simple storage service. Um, since I want this to scale globally, and I may want to spin up VPCs in other areas besides um, US East, I'm going to use Amazon's Route 53, which will basically take a look at the clients, the users that are connecting to my service, decide which is the nearest or the best location for them to go to to interact with my application, and I'll route them that way. Um, I'm going to use a CDN as well, um, which is in Amazon terms, is called they, their, their service is called CloudFront. There's obviously other ones besides Amazon's CDN services. Um, some of those other CDN services allow you to put the web application firewall out there as well, um, but in this, in this case, we're not going to do that. Um, we talked about the VPC, that's my virtual private cloud. And inside of that VPC, well, I've got my internet gateway um, that I'm going to put on my, my public subnet, my DMZ subnet. And then um, I have NACL's network access uh, control list that I can put around those subnets. And then inside those subnets, I have security groups. We're going to talk about all of this again in just a minute. I'm just doing an overview here. Um, all my traffic is going to come into my elastic load balancer, and that's going to basically round robin to um, my instances. I've got a whole bunch of instances. These are built with AMIs, if you're not familiar with that term, Amazon Machine Image, which is basically just a VM image that I can use to deploy, that I can spin up my instances with. Um, so I have several different instances here. As I mentioned, I also am using platform as a service with um, Amazon's relational databases. I have a master and slave that I'm going to be using. Um, everything that I do within this environment, within this um, account, I'm going to be able to monitor with Amazon's CloudWatch. So we'll be able to look at CPU usage, look at disk usage, all that type of thing. And I'll be able to monitor that remotely. Um, and then for the real key infrastructure that I have here, I'm going to have auto scaling groups. So as more and more traffic comes into my website, I'm going to be, uh, be able to automatically scale my web application servers and my app servers to sc scale horizontally to meet that demand. One of the coolest things about Amazon now when it comes to capacity planning, I don't really have to worry about that as much. What I have to make sure I do is I've designed my architecture so that it can do that automatic scaling. I've also put my, uh, all my architecture in two different availability zones. So, so for example, if availability zone one goes out in Amazon, I can immediately roll over seamlessly to availability zone two and get that high availability um, uptime that I'm, that I'm searching for. Finally, if I do things right in the cloud, again, we talk all about automation. Automation is key, it's important. Um, that's where cloud formation templates. I can spin up this whole environment, have it automated with cloud formation templates so that not only can I build this in production, I can also build the exact same thing for test. If I want to move to a new region because I'm expanding my business, I don't have to go through that whole design and deployment process again. I use, I use uh, CloudFormation templates and immediately it's spun up. So let's go through a, a, a typical uh, user connection here. User's going to go out and connect to Route 53. It's going to tell them the data center that they're going to go to. Uh, actually, we'll send it on to, to CloudFront where I've got my CDN content. Um, 
And then if the if that doesn't have the content, obviously it's going to send it on to my um, load balancers, which is going to take that request, send it to my web application firewall. We'll decide whether this uh, this request is malicious or not malicious. If it isn't, it's going to forward it on to my second load balancer, which is then going to send it on to my application servers. And if they need data, they'll go to the databases. And then the re and, and then the uh, data goes back out um, the way it came in. Also, there may be need for me to get updates, like maybe my, my WAF needs to get updates, maybe my app servers need to get updates. So I've set up a, a NAT services device as well. So that's our architecture. Now let's talk about administration of this, right? My administration, I've got admins that are going to be able, that are going to authenticate into my account. They're going to have username and passwords. If I'm really smart, I'm going to require my admins to have multi-factor. Amazon supports this. Right, so now I don't have to worry so much about my admins. If they, if, if their username, passwords get compromised, I don't have to worry so much. If I, if they're compromised, I'm in big trouble. If I've also set things up properly, everybody that logs into my system is going to get assigned a role. That role is going to tell them what privileges they have and what privileges they don't have. Alternatively, there are these things called AWS access keys, which are basically a really long username and password. If I have that access key, I no longer have to have multi-factor authentication. That's a good thing for automation. That's a bad thing um, if those keys get compromised. But again, those when I authenticate with those keys, this is what I'm going to use for my, my automation, right? This is what I have to use for automation. So the security of that stuff is very important. Again, I'm going to get assigned a role, and I'll be able to do things within that Amazon account. Now, we haven't talked about the instances or the machines themselves. In that case, whenever I spin up a new instance, Amazon goes ahead and creates an SSH key that I can, I can decide which one they're going to use. Um, with that SSH key, I'll log into my bastion, and I'll be able to get into my, all my internal hosts to do whatever management I want. So th those are some, some key things to think about in, in measuring. So how do we go about securing this simple architecture? Um, we're going to take the, uh, the traditional... Um, um, Strategy that we hear in security, right? Monitor, assess, defend. We're going to start out with monitoring, right? Detection is important. Most of the time, people are missing just on the detection piece alone. So that's where we're going to focus on first. Detection is important. And that has to be built on a foundation of logs. If I am not collecting logs from absolutely everywhere, my ability to go to detect and then maybe even forensicate, if I maybe I didn't detect, have just, just gone out the window. So those are, those are crucial pieces. Oops. Oops. Secondly, assess and test, right? I want to be able to evaluate my security controls, but there's we are on dangerous ground because now we've got all of our infrastructure running on a service provider and we need to make sure we know what we're doing when we do that. And finally, defense, right? We want to raise the bar. We want to prevent things from, from coming in and being attacks being successful. So let's focus in on monitor first. All right, we're basically we started out with that stack. We're going to start at the top generally speaking, and drill down because as we, as we talked out before, that's where my highest risks are. Risks are. So obviously we, we created our web application firewall. We're going to turn it on so that we can catch bursting thresholds. So if we see like maybe um, evidence of de denial of service attack going on, that I can detect that. I'm going to have it configured around the OWASP top 10. I'm not going to go into that too much detail here. And we're going to have it tuned to the application. The WAF is going to be absolutely no value to me or my organization if I haven't taken the time to tune my web application firewall. We talked about collecting logs, and we um, collect those logs from my application, from my RDSs. Um, I'm really going to look at authorization, authentication authorization logs, right? We talked about stolen creds was number two on the list of what people are going to go after. So I'm going to want to maybe build a baseline and figure out what is regular behavior and what is anomalous behavior. I'm going to collect my ELB um, elastic load balancer logs as well, right? And really what I'm looking for there is I need feedback into my WAF. How effective is my WAF? Is it configured properly? Am I finding the right things? What things am I missing? If I don't have that feedback, I've got an unstable system there. Um, that's going to be something that I'm going to export, and we'll talk about that. 
So another thing, we talked about S3. S3 is simple storage service, right? I can put data in there as well. S3 access logging is not part of CloudTrail logging. It's something that I need to go turn on individually in my S3 buckets. Um, and then I've also got CloudWatch. Your dev, DevOps team are going to be very interested in CloudWatch because that's how they're going to measure the availability and performance of their, their application. Okay, next thing we talked about CloudTrail a whole lot. We talked about, you know, we, when we're, we're looking at what sort of things we want to monitor, we want to use the O, o shoot principle, right? If, if there, are, there are certain things that if that happens, if, I get, if my users are getting 4, 404 errors, I'm like, oh darn, you know, that's, 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 I probably want to take care of that. If I see um, like delete VPC show up, that's an, that's an oh shoot situation, right? And so when I build my monitoring, I want to start at those oh shoot moments, right? Where are those, where are those things that are really going to impact me? The Amazon root account is the account that has all privileges. Um, and if you go in and try to take privileges away from that, they just ignore it. You have all privileges with that root account. So that is one account that I want to make sure is locked down. I want to make sure that for the most part it's never used. If I see my CloudTrail logs, if I see that root account, um, any activity, that's a phone call. I need to call someone and find out what's going on with that because that should be, that should be multi-factor authentication and probably someone else should have the, um, the hardware token to that. Uh, the other thing that I'd be very interested in is if someone goes in and turns off logging for a minute, right? Luckily, Amazon will send you the message before it stops logging, but that's very important. Same, same if, if I got somebody that may be a little bit sneaky, maybe they update where that CloudTrail is logging. It's logging to an S3 bucket. If they change it to log to a different bucket, maybe they, that's another way to hide. So that's another thing. Uh, create delete VPC. Um, that's a bad day in the cloud if you see that event come across your screen. Do you have a question? Yeah, do you, uh, do you do testing, like, I assume the first time you build it, you test it. You absolutely, absolutely want to test it. So the question is, is how often do we do um, testing? And we should be testing all the time on the security team. We should have operations team saying, hey, is this still firing? Is it... And then also, you know, when you're building this, when you're setting this up, you have to ask the question, this is what I'm expecting, but when what's in real use is, is what am I expecting and what am I seeing the same thing? And how is that changing over time? And so, yes, obviously, continuous, continuous testing is very important. Um, create access key, Amazon access keys. We're going to talk a lot about this, right? Those are essentially, if, if I, depending on the privileges given to them, the role that's given to them, right? But those are keys into my data center. They can spin up instances, they can delete instances, they can do whatever they want. You know, those are key, those are virtual keys into your data center. So anytime an access key is created, I'm going to want to investigate that. I'm going to say, hey, was this expected? Who has it? What are the privileges on it? Those types of things. Any sort of privilege role assignment, I should be probably following up on that. Um, looking at some of the Route 53, delete hosted zone. So a lot of my DNS entries, if I see an event like that, what's going on? You know, um, change resource record set. Again, changes, not maybe deleting it, but changes to it. Um, another really interesting we're gonna hit thing is, and we're gonna hit upon this again later, is run instance. I wanna look at how many new VM images are being started up, right? If that dramatically increases, did, did, I, did someone just have their account compromised or, or, or did we just lose some AWS access keys or someone's account compromised and maybe someone's now spinning up instances to do Bitcoin mining? We'll talk about that in a minute as well. Any sort of uh, public security group, those security groups around our instances, any modification to those in that public zone, that's probably something I want to investigate. On top of that, uh, we talked about IAM is very important access keys. Um, I'm not going to be able to inventory any of that stuff with CloudTrail. Again, it's just telling me the changes. I'm going to spin up a security instance here in my application that I can go in and I can use the Amazon APIs and I can go in and do, I can go in and take a look at um, the access keys. Who are the owners? Who's the, who's the owner? When was the last date that key was recycled? Because I'm probably going to want to recycle those every 60 to 90 days. All those types of things I'm going to be interested in. Let's go down the stack a little bit. OS instances. 
We talked about the cloud. We talked about agility, right? If we're, these OS instances are going to be spun up, spun down based on the, the, um, the load that's coming to my application. As a security expert, I need to be able to support my development, my, dev, my ops team, and I have to treat those instances, this is a perfect quote that we've used in the church. We have to be able to treat them as cattle. If we're treating them as pets, we're doing it wrong. So our security strategy has to be able to meet, meet the, new, the, the changes that the cloud is pushing at us. Um, and one of the ways that I think really makes sense is file integrity monitoring. Um, for a, a long time, I looked at file integrity monitoring. I said, this makes sense, but it is really hard. Here's a, here's a situation or a scenario where I think file integrity monitoring makes sense. Right? I want to take those instances, those AMIs that I've got, and I want to snapshot them. Right? These things are going to be spun up automatically, spun down automatically. I sh it should be easy for me to tell if one of these things is not like the others. Right? And if it is, if it isn't, then that's something I probably want to investigate. It's going to require me to put a little more process, be a little bit more disciplined. Right? Anytime I have new code deployed, anytime we start using new AMIs, patching, I'm going to keep those up to date. But again, it's just here's my, here's my image, boom, if it changes, I need to be aware of that. Right? I'm also going to want to collect syslog and event logs because if something does occur, I may want to do some forensics there. All right, so we talked about the event monitoring system. I call it event monitoring system because I think in the cloud it makes a lot of sense that the events and the things that I'm looking at from a security perspective is also available to my, um, my developer and my operations team, right? There's a good synergy there, whoops, a good synergy there that they're going to they're gonna want to look at their logs for operational performance. I'm going to want to look for, for security. If we can bring those things together, that makes a lot of sense in my mind. Again, we talked about that oh shoot principle. That's the type of, those are the things I'm going to want to start looking at. And then once I've got those in place, I'm going to want to start looking, looking down into the system. Moving forward, let's go into assess. All right. So do you like working in the technology field? Do you want to keep it that way? You need to be very careful about how you do assessment in the cloud. Um, you're running on someone else's infrastructure. And so, you know, if you just go out there, and do that, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. Um, I'll, you know, not just talking to the cloud provider, you also need to talk to the organization you're working at. Because you may have permission from the cloud provider, but not from your organization. That will get you into just as much trouble. Right? Pen testers talk about getting written, written permission. They call that their get out of jail free card, right? If I have that written permission, that tells me what I can do, and that I have been given that authorization to do it. So. Word of warning to you. Okay, so let's let's start looking at assess and test. I'm um, going back down through our stack, our our, um, our stack. So static code analysis. Um, there are a lot of tools out there that you can buy right now that will do static code analysis, look for secure coding practices, look for plain text credentials. We're also going to want to look for um, plain text access keys in there, right? If if those access keys are in there then anybody who has access to that code, they can get those keys, and I'm gonna have an oh shoot moment for sure, right? We talk, we talk about DevOps all the time, uh, but why don't we insert security into that whole process? Who on my, de on my DevOps team is the belly button, the person responsible for security? I think that's something that we gotta look at when we move to the cloud. We, should have, we could have risk managers, we have security architects that these people can come to and talk to, but when it comes down to it, who is responsible for security on that dev team? And as they're building this, as they're writing their code, as they're doing all these things, who's responsible to make sure that all those security tasks get done? Um, cloud formation templates. We talked about that, the ability to spin, to, to create our, our, um, our, our uh, application out there in the cloud. We should have a process about you know, reviewing that before running that and, and pushing things out into production. Um, drilling down a little bit, we talked about this before, incident uh, identity and access management. Um, we should be looking at what roles and who has the responsibility to make sure that those roles are assigned. Are people moving in and out of the development team, make sure that that's up to date. Um, remember, in, in the cloud, users and instances can have privileged roles. And if I am maybe a user that has lower roles, but I, have a, I can SSH into an instance, 
that has elevated roles, I just got elevation of privs by SSHing to that application. So I should be looking at real closely what type of roles I'm assigning to my instances and what's going on there. And another important thing is separation of duties. This is not anything new to anybody here. We're gonna talk about why that's really important in the cloud though. Um, one thing, again, this is something that we should be able to automate in the cloud. We have those APIs, we have the CLI. This is not a manual process. We need to think about making this an automated process. That way it's done automatically. I don't have to spend a lot of time or resources in, in order to do this. Okay, we wanna look at the AMYs, Amazon Machine um, Image. We wanna make sure that we're looking at those to see what ones are in use. There's a lot of AMYs that are out there. They're built by other people. We don't know who those people are. If we, we, we start using those, what sort of, what sort of um, risk could we just expose our organization to? Right, so assessing what we're using there. Security group configuration, we talked We'll talk about that more. That's the that's the network app, the network controls around each instance or group of instances. And Amazon has another thing called Trusted Advisor, that is basically um, basically a, a Amazon's way of looking at all the best practices. And I apologize, this isn't a very clear um, capture that I've got here, but it's going to go through and look at all the common mistakes that people. Um, have made in moving to the cloud. So for example, MFA not on the root account. That is a check and you will get that in Trusted Advisor. Again, this is, this is the console view of it. This is also available in the CLI. That's something you can automate. If, the, if anything that sees, shows up here as being an, a thing, a, a, a risk, you can put it into your um, uh, event management system and have someone look at it. It, does, it looks at S3 um, bucket access controls, it looks at CloudTrail logging. It looks at, at a whole bunch of things. We're not going to go into all those here. All right, let's talk about defense real quickly. Okay, we're going to look at, this, this covers the whole stack initially, right? Contractual agreements, vendor attestations, right? I want to make sure that the, the portion that the vendor is responsible for, my cloud provider is responsible for, is covered in my contracts. If it's not, even though I may think that I'm, I don't have to worry about those things, I still do because it's not in my contracts. I also want to look at vendor attestations, right? That's important to make sure that what they're saying has been validated by a third party. All right, we talked about a resilient architecture and we're gonna go over that a lot. Um, when you're looking at the cloud, resilient architecture means a lot of things. First, your application has to be decoupled. Your instances that are out there running have to do one thing and that one thing really well. If it's doing a lot of things and it's relying on state on other systems and stuff like that, I've not decoupled my application, it's likely that I'm not gonna be successful in a um, auto-scaling uh, implementation in the cloud. We talked about multi-availability zones, so if one availability zone, availability zone goes down, that I can roll over to the other one without it uh, affecting my uh, uptime. And obviously security is important. We talked about automation is key in the cloud. Um, also, I want to make sure that all of my snapshots and my backups of my data that I have a process in place there. My um, last, oh, excuse me, um, EBSs, those basically that's going to be my elastic block storage. When I spin up a new instance, there is a portion of that instance that is volatile and that when I stop or shut down that instance, it, it disappears. It's no longer there. And then I have my attached storage, uh, the EC, e, EBS, that's gonna be non-volatile. And I can take that EBS and I can detach it from one instance and attach it to another one. That's where I'm gonna be able to keep my, my data static. I'm gonna to need to have backups of all that. Okay, so let's start out with encryption. Amazon has a great service um, called Key Management Service, KMS. It's basically centralized key management. Anything that, any access to those keys is gonna be tracked in CloudTrail. With those keys, I'll be able to encrypt my EBS, my elastic block storage. Um, I'll be able to encrypt other types of data. Um, and in the case of my instances, Amazon guarantees that encryption of, those, of that storage is not going to affect the performance of those instances. They guarantee the performance of those instances um, based on what you subscribe for. So this is, this is a no-brainer, right? This is not going to impact your application by encrypting your data that's maybe on the drive. 
I can encrypt credentials and, and maybe other, other sensitive data. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, talk to me about that after, because PCI is going to be a, a little bit different. I I, uh, I know that people are making PC, are, are achieving PCI compliance in the cloud, but that's that's a pretty involved um, response, I think. So let's talk about that after. Right. They do have that service. Right. right. So, looking at uh, our application, um, we're going to hit up on this again, web application firewall. We had it out there in monitor mode. We need, in order to really defend our organization, we need to get it to blocking mode. That's again going to require some discipline on me working with, or whoever it is that uh, handles the web application fire, firewall, working with the dev team, making sure that I'm in the change control process. So anytime they roll something out, I'm there with my new WAF um, policy and that we're able to validate that, right? We want to block, obviously, the malicious traffic. And if I can get this into blocking mode, you know, if I get like a denial of, a ser denial of service attack coming to me and I block that at my WAF firewall, then I am not spinning up instances behind uh, my, my back-end web application servers. I'm not spinning those up and paying those additional charges um, to, to service that additional traffic. I'll have to do that with my web application firewall, but I don't want to have to do that in two places. So, again, rate limiting, being able to, if I'm getting the same IP hit me over and over again, I can turn that on and save some money. Um, and let's... Let's talk about a little bit about evaluating our WAF effectiveness through our HTTP request logs. Um, I think maybe this may be a common practice, but you ever take a look at your request logs and let's say that um, what I want to do is I just want to see the length of the request, like maybe the full URL request, um, the URL and the query string. And I just want to do a histogram plot of that. Let's say that I see the, aver the average request that I'm seeing is 50 bytes. Those are usually 50 bytes long. I'm just totally making that up, right? And that's the majority of it. And then I have this corner case where it's a whole lot more than 50 bytes. Maybe it's 200 bytes or something like that. And so maybe I focus in on that. Wow, that's abnormal behavior. Uh, let's take a look at that data. Let's take a look at, let's also throw in what the status code is. You know, is it a 200 okay? Is it a 404? Is it, is it, a, is it a 500 error? Let's take a look at those status codes. Oh, wow, I've got a whole bunch of 500 error codes or maybe no responses or stuff like that. Let's drill into those. Oh, wow, I've got SQL injection going on there. Or I may have cross-site scripting. I may have someone trying to um, upload a malicious file. Let's go back and see, hey, is our WAF catching that? Is it seeing that? You know, good feedback test there. Okay, so... Let's, let's move back down to our application, file, uh, application frame, framework, right? Who, who here has time to manage um, two identity providers, right? We talked about how, how we have IAM out there in Amazon. You also have the, the stuff that you have at work. Well, Amazon has um, made it possible for you to use things like SAML authentication. So you can authenticate to your own identity provider, manage all your roles, your group memberships there. And then take that, and then when you authenticate, your, your IDP gives you back your SAML token. You then pass that on to Amazon, says, hey, here's my SAML token, and then it gives you, assigns you a role. Um, and then with that role, I can go in and do whatever I need to. Um, also, I can take that, and I can do the same sort of thing with my um, API, or, yeah, my API authentication or my, or, or my CLI authentication where I can authenticate, it will give me back a temporary access token that usually is about, has a maximum life of an hour. So now, with all my DevOps, rather than giving them permanent access keys, I can give them temporary access keys that have an expiration date on them. 
awesome, right? My applications, not all applications are to this point yet, but they need to get to this point where they can use those EC2 instances. Remember, we can assign those a role to give them specific um, capabilities, per permissions to do things on Amazon Cloud or Amazon um, services. I should be, all my applications should be using those instance roles. Again, those instance roles have an access key that they can access from essentially their Amazon environment that expire. So every, you know, and they have a, they have a, I don't know what the expiration is, it's probably about eight hours, I think. So that those are constantly recycled. Here, now I'm reducing the number of keys I have to generate. That is a very good thing. Um, and I've even read so, so much that if you're not using those two, if you're, 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 you're uh, sorry, your applications are not using the roles, you're doing cloud wrong because now you have another manual process to making sure that those keys are on your AMIs as those get spun up. It's just creating more nightmare for you, right? To do it right, use the roles are provided to the to the instance. Um, anytime I have to, there's there's always going to be those cases where I have to create permanent access keys. Anytime I do that, I want to make sure I do least privilege, and I want to make sure that where where I, where they have elevated privileges, that I rotate those keys regularly, right? And then I'll, I'll, we talked about this before: scour code, configs, looking for those things, and making sure that those are taken care of. All right. Said so we talked about maybe few, no presentations good without a few interesting stories, right? Um, here we have a developer that was going out. He was, wanting to, he was excited to learn about the cloud. He was, he was learning what he could do. He was deploying code out there and took his credentials, put him, uh, checked his, his code in, back into GitHub and thought for a minute, oh wait, what did I just do there? Well, look, looked in his code, did I put my access keys in there? Yeah, they're there. He had them removed within five minutes. Thought, oh, I'm good. I got him out of there pretty quickly, right? The next morning he woke up, four emails from Amazon and one phone call saying, hey, something's going on with your account. We, we think you ought to take a look at it, right? 140 servers were spun up, probably Bitcoin mining, and he, he was stuck with a $2,300 $2, bill, right? Luckily, he was able to explain to Amazon um, what was going on, and they were kind, you know, this, this one time, um, we'll drop the charges. I don't think Amazon's going to do that through Infinity, right? So access key is very, uh, management is very important. Just a developer, right? Not even an organization. All right. We talked about this a lot. I'm going to hit on it again, right? Multi-factor authentication is an important defensive measure. Um, it should be done on my root account. Any highly privileged account should require multi-factor authentication as well. Separation of duties is going to be very key in the cloud. Um, and making sure that we have leaks privileged. And we're going to talk about why that's important in a second. Access to that backup data is key. Another great story, right? Code spaces. Um, one day, the employees came into work and noticed they had a ransom note on their website, right? Hey, contact us. Um, you pay us a whole bunch of money, and we won't take you down. They thought, oh, crud. What are we going to do? Well, they, they started to take evasive action, right? We're going to try to lock this guy out. The attacker said, oh, yeah, I expected you guys to do that. Deleted all of their data. They didn't have good, they didn't good, have, they didn't have good separation of duties, so that, that, that attacker had access to all that, deleted all their data. At which point, what do you do? You know, all our data's gone, we have to close our doors, right? Separate, separation of duties is key in the cloud. One additional note on incident response, right? When you, when you see something that indicates, hey, we may be compromised here, this makes good sense in an organization, it's especially true in the cloud, right? Investigate without trying to tip off the attacker. Because if the attacker sees, hey, I've been discovered, or, 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 or um, gets any sort of indication of that, his response is probably, or is, is most likely gonna be automated so that you type in the command line is not going to be him. He's going to have an automated response. As organizations, we, when we discover things, our response should also include automation. Automation is key in the cloud. Okay, let's talk about operating systems. Um, we want to make sure we use trusted AMIs, right? I, if I, some AMIs that are out there, 
if I go out there and get that AMI today, and there are new patches tomorrow, some of those AMIs will be kept updated. I don't have to patch my AMIs, I just have to go get the new AMIs. Great, great way of uh, uh, planning for your, your, um, uh, your architecture in the cloud. Um, Marketplace has disassisted compliant AMIs as well. Great, you don't have to build those yourself, you can just go out there and buy those, right? You pay an hourly rate on them. Um, we talked about if, if our FIM tests fail, investigate first, right? What's going on? Do we understand what's really going on here? Once we got an idea, you know, blow that old instance away. It's cattle. It's, we don't want to treat it as pet. It's cattle. Isolate it, blow it away. If I want to do forensics on it, I can do that. And then auto scaling, we're just going to spin up a new instance, right? Um, again, when we look at our AMIs, we want to make sure that our auto scaling is using the right one. We talked about SSH um, keys. Here's, here's a little bit of a headache in the cloud, right? Um, we want to be able to treat these instances as cattle. You need to have a good SSH key management um, um, strategy in place. Maybe I manage that at the bastion. Maybe I manage that at a prod and non-prod level that I have SSH keys for prod. Maybe I spin up an instance that I can do some ident I, I have an active directory um, instance out there in my environment that, that uses that for authentication. Um, something that definitely needs to be looked at. Um, the, probably the worst case scenario is manage that on an AMI by AMI basis. As people leave the organization, I'm going to update my AMI with new keys. But uh, that's better than not doing that. Okay, really quickly, let's talk about NACLs and security groups. Uh, NACLs, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. These are stateless. These are stateless. I can have them inbound and outbound. I'm limited to 20 per subnet, 20 inbound, 20 outbound. Since they're stateless, I have to open up the ephemeral ports. It's not going to be a great solution for me. But don't lose hope yet. Let's look, look at security groups. Okay, NACLs, we, like we said, talk, are, are, are at the um, subnet level. At security groups, these are stateful, inbound, outbound. I can apply them to a single instance or a group of instances. Um, and AWS puts some limits on them, and it really is an it depends on how many security groups you have, how many rules you have per security group, and you have to really look at their documentation and understand um, how to do that or how to manage that. Um, but let's take let's just take a look here. Let's just do a couple of examples, right? I've got my elastic load balancer um, that exposed exposed on the uh, external site. I'm going to allow 18443 in from anywhere. I'm going to allow ping in and anywhere else and anything else I'm going to deny. Um, with my security group, I can say, hey, I don't want my elastic load balancers going to my app servers without going through my WAF. So I create a, a rule that only allows that, those to talk to my WAF web application firewalls. This gives us very granular control of, at a network layer of who can talk to who within my, within my application. Right? I'm going to skip the WAF. I'm going to jump right down into um, my application servers. And I'm going to allow my application servers to talk to my own databases, obviously. And I can call, I don't have to call these out by IP address. I can call them out by security group name. So I don't have to say app servers of this, you know, are going to be able allowed to talk to these IP addresses. I can say anybody that's in the database security group, they can talk to. Right? And I can have my database security group spawn both availability zones so that I don't have to create one per availability zone. Um, so some great capabilities there as far as um, writing um, network controls. A couple last notes, right? The Bastion host, that's, if, if I don't have a VPN connection from my network or anything like that, I have this Bastion host sitting out there. Uh, when I've spun one up before, it took, you guys are all familiar with this, within five minutes, people are trying to log into that, right? If you don't need the Bastion host, you don't need to administer anything, you can just turn it off, you know, put it in a stop state, and then it's just not there. Um, but let's, let's take this maybe one step further, right? Is there such a thing as cloud nirvana? where nobody needs to have access to my environment. I see a lot of posts out there on the internet where they say everything in my environment needs to be automated. It has to be automated in order for me to be able to scale. At that point, who really needs to be able to access my prod environment? Um, one blogger talked about how if he SS has to SSH into an instance to start doing some configuration, he, has to, he says, I'm doing this wrong. 
what do I need to do to automate this? Right, and that's from an operational standpoint, right? From a security standpoint, that gives us a lot of extra assurances as well. When my prod environments that are out there, I don't have to worry about my admins being able to get into that and do things, right? I have to man manage the processes around that, but not that instance itself, those, that, that uh, environment itself. If I can do that, if I can get that automation pl in place, I also can now um, spin up, take, take that exact thing, spin up a test environment, spin up a new uh, um, uh, environment out in Africa or wherever else I want to start doing businesses. All automated, I can probably do that within minutes, right? Or at the worst case, hours, bring up a whole new environment. So, additional resources. Um, Amazon has a whole bunch of security white papers. They're updating these constantly. Uh, if you go to aws.amazon.com or docs, um, they have a whole lot of great information out there. Um, a few other things. Quick Labs is another great thing. For like $40, you can go out and buy Amazon Quick Labs. They have a whole lab for you to do that gives you instructions on what to do. And and they have things covering, covering from uh, API, CLIs, that sort of thing, to auto scaling, to cloud formation templates, to all sorts of stuff. Great resource, resources out there. All right, with that, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Um, I, I could make them uh, available. I think these are being recorded, right? So this will be on on uh, on uh, YouTube as well. So if you want to, you can send me an email. Um, come talk to me afterwards, and I'll give you my email. All right. Thank you. Any other? All right. Thanks. Okay.